I'll try again. My name is Alexandra Helen Nicholas. I'm a film critic from Triple R and the editor of and editor at the film journal Senses of Cinema. Um, I've written five books on horror, cult, and exploitation film, um, and do a bunch of writing, especially on horror, cult, and exploitation film, um, and films like the one that we've just seen. I am joined here to talk to you tonight about The Untamed uh, with Spiro Econom. I knew that I would do that. <laughs> I knew it. Spiro Economopoulos, uh, who is the program director for the Melbourne Queer Film Festival as well as a programmer at ACME. Spiro has served on the feature jury panel for Frameline Film Festival in San Francisco and was the film and arts writer for Melbourne Star Observer. He holds a, master, holds a master's in cinema studies from La Trobe University. <gasps> so do I. Oh my God. And Carrie White is his spirit animal. She's mine too. She's mine too, totally. This is good. <laughs> yeah. This is Cesar Alvaran Torres, um, who is a lecturer in media and communication at Swinburne University of Technology, where he teaches in cinema and screen studies. He's been widely published in academic and non-academic titles as a film and literary crit critic, author and translator. He is the former editor of Cine Premier magazine in Mexico and the founding editor of cinepremier.com.mx, the most widely read film website in the Spanish-speaking Spanish world. Holy shit. That's really impressive. Oh, thanks. My <laughs> goodness. He has written about the Mexican film industry for more than a decade. Yeah. I'm glad you're here tonight. 15 you know, years, maybe. Yeah. We need your help with this we, movie. We do. We really need your help <laughs> with too. this movie. <laughs> um, between the three of us, we each have kind of specific and merging critical superpowers. If I don't, if I can tweet our own trumpet, somehow we will work through this film together yep. with you tonight. We will not pay for your therapy. We're glad that you've stayed here to talk about this amazing, extraordinary film with us. Um, to get the ball rolling, I guess, before we start getting into the nitty gritty, we might um, just kind of check with everybody about how, how, how did you first come across this film and what was your response the first time that you saw it, Spiro? Um, well, actually, the, the first time I saw the movie was um, at MIFF. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my first experience of it, seeing it on the big screen, mm -hmm. which is really great. Um, and, yeah, look, I had, you know, as I could well, tell you now, I'm sorry, I don't know, you know, like I, I won't be able to answer all the questions that the film kind of poses. But um, I, you know, I'm a big horror fan so I think that's mm. that was the thing that it kind of really connected with me and I really liked for me I sort of came out of it with all these kind of references going through my head and it was Possession it was Cronenberg and then started to unpack that mm. but also uh, Under the Skin was another movie that kind mm -hmm. of came into my mind mm. when I when I was watching it and interestingly enough so yeah I don't know it was all kind of all very um, uh, um, my reactions to it were really sort of emotional rather than sort of cerebral i suppose and not until later and that's mm. you know we were talking about it before sort of unpacking it all and it was sort of yeah yeah i'm the same i think it's um i, I discovered this film at the start of the year when i wrote um an essay for it for arrow video in the uk um, that accompanied their blu-ray release and they approached me to write it because they knew that i love uh, andre zolowski's possession which is mm -hmm. another sort of alien fuck beast film for those of you who haven't seen it. it's playing at acme on the 4th and 7th because andre zolowski's uh, dedicated that's the first time that Fuck Beast, I think, is going to be used. Maybe no, not the last. No, it won't be. No, I don't think it'll be the no. last. No. <laughs> um, Zolowski's, uh, the film is dedicated to Zolowski. Um, it's a huge influence on this film. Um, Acme will be playing a double of The Untamed and Possession on the 4th and the 7th if you wanted to see Possession on the big screen. Mm. It's a very, very rare experience. Mm. Um, and Arrow approached me and they said, well, the un have you seen The Untamed? And I said, no. And they said, well, this is your new favourite film. <laughs> Um, and they were quite confident of this. And um, sure enough, I watched it. And you said your new favourite film? Yeah, it is my new favourite <laughs> film. This is, this is probably my film of the year um, without any um, hyperbole. How about you, Cesar? How did you come across this? Well, I have been following uh, Amat Escalante's career since his first movie, Sangre, which is set in Guanajuato as well, which is a very, very conservative city in uh, the middle of Mexico, smack in the middle of Mexico. It's one of the places where the conservative party, PAN, has uh, the most power. So I was fascinated by Sangre. Uh, he's very closely related to Carlos Reigadas in terms of collaboration, who's another very big f Mexican filmmaker in the festival circuit. Uh, His film, uh, Post Tenebrous Lux, from 2012? Yeah. I think yeah. That, played, that played in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful film. 
The one with the red animated devil, if anybody yeah, knows exactly. the little devil figure, it's beautiful. So then uh, Los Bastardos, and then uh, Ellie, which was, I guess, my favorite film of 2011, I think it was, which depicts the Mexican cartel violence in a very graphic, very social realist kind of way, which uh, led to uh, The Untamed, La Región Salvaje. So I was interested in this film right from when I first heard about it. Um, I think my take on it is a little bit different. I saw it as a more realist film mm. and a more metaphorical film about the situation in Mexico. So on one hand, we have uh, homophobia, which runs rampant in Mexican culture. And on the other hand, we have a lot of uh, women being murdered mm -hmm. and also mass graves being found throughout the country, uh, product of the cartel wars. So this sense of human bodies being disposable, mm -hmm. being objects for desire and objects for uh, sadistic pleasure, mm -hmm. I think was what I got from this film. And I felt like the original title in Spanish is La Región Salvaje, which translates as a savage region. So for me, it was more of a wink to the current situation in, uh, in Mexico, the current political situation in Mexico, where a lot of crimes go unsolved, where there's such a mass of you know, corpses and bodies that it's almost, um, it almost seems like a possibility that an alien came down from space and killed everyone. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, it, so, it, so I have a different take on it. <laughs> hmm. Did it also have sex with everybody? I don't, I'm not I'm, sure. I've got questions. No, no, but, no, but, <laughs> no but, but sexual crimes are certainly, uh, you know, are, are like very part of the picture. Part of yeah. the picture, like in the city of Juarez, where a lot of the uh, killings of women happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the theories is that these women are killed for snuff filmmaking. So they are killed on camera to be consumed by, you know, uh, generally American sex mm. tourists, right? So, yeah. Those ideas of spectatorship and mm. consent, I think, really run through the film. Like, even without that, that extraordinary background, I think that, that um, for me as, you know, a, a, a little girl in Melbourne, like, I, you really pick up on this sort of focus on the, the nuances of consent mm -hmm. and just these sort of, fine lines, I guess, that, mm -hmm. that can be crossed in quite spectacular and horrific fashion. And also spectatorship, just the spec, you know, just watching violence. Um, there's a scene, it's not really an action scene, but it really stays with me of all the strange moments in this film where um, Fabian's body is discovered lying mm -hmm. in water and the camera pulls back and there's a family just sitting, it almost looks like a constable painting, there's a family just sitting there watching this unfold and I find the family watching far more chilling than I find the discovery mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. murdered naked body. Yeah. Um, there's this real problematizing of, of, um, of that kind of watching of yeah. death. I think that, mm. you know, this, this background kind of fills in those blanks, I guess, yeah, a little course. bit for me. But I guess for us who come from more of a horror background, yeah. um, this, this reads quite powerfully as, as, a, as a, I guess, what's called a kind of art horror film which of course mm. goes back to things like uh, Georges Franju's Eyes Without a Face, which has been read as a film um, about French guilt, about um, the Holocaust. And mm. um, I mean, these, these films have been hugely awarded. Heli won the um, Best Director at Cannes. Yep. Um, the Untamed won, was it Silver in Lion. Venice? Silver Lion. Yeah, it was a Silver Venice, Lion at yeah. Venice. Um, so these are certainly acclaimed films. Um, Spiro, I, just coming to this... Um, sort of art horror thing. I mean, what, what are the kind of films? You've, we've already mentioned Cronenberg and um, mm. Possession, but yeah. particularly in, the, in this queer, I mean, this is a, an area of expertise for you, is queer cin cinema. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious about this intersection of, of the horror genre mm. with, with dealing with these kind of um, yeah. issues of, of sexual identity. Well, it's, it's um, I'm interesting, actually. Generally speaking, um, there's a massive queer fan base in horror, which is really interesting, and but also not surprising in a way, because I think horror is a, a great genre that sort of deals with the idea of you know hidden fears, hidden desires, repression, and uh, also the other. And the idea of being the other is something that people in the LGBTIQ community can identify with and relate to. Um, and I think horror becomes like a really sort of you know, potent 
um, an exciting genre for that reason. Um, and also, to be honest with you, even the act of watching horror, like I think, um, you know, you already position yourself as an outsider, maybe, you know, dealing with material that is transgressive or antisocial. You know, I think as a kid, you know, I was constantly having to justify why I was watching horror films and, you know, I felt like I came out twice. I came out as a horror fan and as a gay man. <laughs> so it was like a primer for coming out basically, you know. And um, and I think, uh, I mean, obviously um, throughout horror, the genre, like any genre really, you know, gay characters are sort of present and pop up. You know, there's films like, you know, Daughters of Darkness, Fright Night. Or the Hammer um, Horror. Hammer, yeah, 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 The Haunting. You know, mm -hmm. so the, there's queer characters throughout. And I, but I think... Um, what horror does so well is kind of look at the um, idea of sort of, you know, repression and its consequences. And so mm. narratives like the coming out narrative become really interesting in kind of horror, essentially. So, I mean, uh, we're talking about Nightmare on Elm Street 2, which is one of the best accidental queer horror movies ever made. The Hitcher, I think, falls in that category Yeah, The Hitcher, as well. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, a, f a film that we actually screened at MQFF a couple of years back called Closet Monster... And they, uh, both those films take that idea of uh, coming out and, and it's, it literally manifests itself in these characters as this physical thing that is ripping, wanting to rip itself out of your body. And, you know, the more the characters try to repress it, the more it violently kind of fights back. And so it sort of visually and metaphorically becomes, you know, really rich and interesting kind of in the horror genre. So I always kind of find it really fascinating when I see... Um, sexuality portrayed and as in you know the untamed i think mm. the way that deals with repression um is interesting and complicated as well the way um i'm going to say angel and it's not angel but <laughs> and way angel's character <laughs> you just need to cue you to say yeah, it yeah i just pronounce it so again, beautifully please, yeah um you know the you know his kind of the repression behind that kind of character mm. and how that sort of plays out in the film and and also the way men and women are portrayed in that as yeah. well so the it's interesting that the male characters in that movie um, can't handle it as well, I guess is kind of a funny thing to say, more than what the female characters sort of can. It's interesting that... Um, I sort of segue I, a bit there. But. I, I guess I, I, I came to this film, I guess, um, I've, he I've heard it called post-horror, that this sort of newish kind of subgenre. I'm not fond mm. of that. I've, I think it's better. I, I have a friend who's a critic who, who calls it not horror. Not horror. Capital <coughs> N, capital H, not horror post-horror, yeah. the sort of films that, that uh, they utilise the codes and conventions of horror, but they're not yeah. horror films. So things like A Ghost Story, hmm. I guess, most recently. It comes um, in light, so I think another yeah, one's mentioned yeah. about that. Um, yeah. Cesar, I'm interested that, that um, I would love to hear more, I guess, about the background um, that you're referring to, this sort of, more so, this sort of social realism, um, yeah. Mexican social realism that this film is really feeding on. Um, I'd love a little bit more background about those sort of traditions that this film is sort of locking into or rejecting. Well, I think that, um, I mean, Spear and I were chatting about how clear the film is in what it wants to achieve right from mm. the beginning. Yeah. You have that Opening really scene, strange yeah. space image and then you have right away the image of uh, Vero having uh, sex with a monster, right? You can say fuck beast. It's all right. We're with friends. a fuck beast, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say it, fuck beast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I do think that it fits into two thi three things. One, uh, the role of women in Mexico mm -hmm. and this fear of female sexuality mm -hmm. in uh, Mexican culture in particular, but in uh, Latin American culture in general. The fear of the indigenous Mm -hmm. I find it quite revealing that in that uh, like animal orgy, there is a short sh squinkle, which is like traditionally an Aztec dog, so uh, which you don't see in any other place other than hipster neighborhoods in Mexico City. It's a hipster thing to have a like an indigenous dog now, right? But this like going back to the going back to the indigenous, and also this fear of this homophobia, this rampant homophobia hmm. in uh, in Mexican society. Uh, some films have done it, uh, talking about same-sex uh, uh, sex on screen. I can only think of uh, El Callejón de los Milagros, which was based on, on a Nagif Mahfouz uh, novel, mm -hmm. which has, uh, didn't portray same-sex uh, sex, but uh, came close. There was a, a gay relationship. Other than that, uh, Mexican filmmakers have been very careful sort of like not to disrupt establishment. Mm -hmm. Why? Because a lot of films, including this one, 
get support from uh, IMCINE, which is the Mexican Institute for Film. And, um, and they sort of like don't want to, to deal with that. Right. But I do think that it follows the tradition of filmmakers like uh, Ripstein, Arturo mm -hmm. Ripstein. Arturo uh, Ripstein's film, Blake Street, played at MIF last year. If yeah. anybody saw that, it's mm -hmm. just an extraordinary film. Yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. plays in tradition of established filmmakers mm -hmm. like him. Uh, if you think of uh, the earlier Buñuel, for instance, Los Olvidados, which is like the basis for any sort mm -hmm. of like social realism mm -hmm. yeah. in Mexico, I think it, it deals with that. Mm. Now, I understand you were saying before this film hasn't got distribution in Mexico. No, it hasn't. It hasn't. Uh, the Mexico distribution system is, is a split between two companies, Cinemex, which is owned by a Canadian conglomerate, I think, and Cinepolis, which is owned by this very conservative uh, family, the Ramirez family. So I think there's a little bit of that. And also fear of it not being commercial. You know, I mean, Ellie got distribution only because it won Best Director at Cannes. Otherwise, it would have just flown on, under the radar of the distribution system. Mm -hmm. And marketing this as horror is a bit tricky mm -hmm. in Mexico because it's not, I mean, movies like Hostel or Saw or anything yeah. that's super gory is very, very successful mm -hmm. in Mexico. Yeah. I guess um, but this is not that gory. It's not that, no, not yeah. at all. What's your experience, Spiro, um, I guess in, in two ways. What's your experience with Mexican horror mm -hmm. and what's your experience with um, kind of queer Mexican film. Yeah. I, I'm curious about those two strands yeah. of just stuff that's kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. I mean, Guillermo del Toro, I guess, is an obvious yeah, yeah. figure in, in the genre um, for all of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our, our and hope. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Our hope. It's our like, hope, yeah. yes. Our hope, our, our hope. hope. and our hope, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I guess I can speak to my experience as the, you know, the program director for the Queer Film Festival. And I actually think it's a really interesting time um, with queer um, cinema in a lot of the Latin American countries in general mm -hmm. and Mexican cinema over the last two years, we've actually programmed uh, quite a few films um, from, you know, from Mexico and, you know, a lot of places like, you know, one, one film called A Promise You Anarchy and, you know, I, there's a lot of stuff out there and I think it's kind of interesting that, um, uh, you know, I've sort of, yeah. And interesting because we were talking before as well that, you know, it, the genesis essentially for the untamed were a series of articles that the director mm -hmm. um read one was about a, a really horrible um rape case where a woman um was basically you know, sort of shamed by the media and sort of was a horrible victim blaming mm -hmm. and a very horrific gay hate crime as well and that was the other sort of and the way that was portrayed in the media was really sensationalist and really horrible um but Again, you know, Mexico have had, you know, marriage equality since, you know, 2000. And Mexico City. Mexico City, yeah, yeah. right, th since 2010, which is sort of interesting. So, I don't know, it's sort of a, it's, I know, it's kind of complicated really in a way, but it's interesting. Um, yeah. I, w I was going to segue from there into, um, I guess, into Mexican, even though we've kind of established that it's not really a horror film, but it kind of yeah. plays with horror. I... I am curious, I guess, just for my own, for my own benefit, just um, hearing from you, Cesar, more about recent Mexican horror. Like, I mean, I know stuff like, um, um, uh, was it We Are Who We Are? Is that the, yeah. the cannibal film from yeah, 2010? Yeah, and, and there's another cannibal film that came out uh, mm -hmm. last year called Somos la Carne. Okay. We Are the Meat, or We Are Meat. We yeah. Are Meat. Which is also... That's how you name a film? That's great. Yeah, and, and there's also a, an anthology series called Mexico Macabro, which is like oh, Macabro, yep. Mexico. Yep. Mm -hmm which is a series of short films mm -hmm. on current violence. So I think that... How do these deviate, I guess, from sort of earlier Mexican horror? So, you know, Curse of the Doll People or... Um, yeah, you know, the Santo, you know, the Santo was my, my introduction to well, Mexican like horror. Well, horror, like, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, like comedy horror. Like superhero How dare movies, you? How dare yeah, you I think, the Santo I think it has comedy. gone from the... I mean, there was a period there in the uh, mid-2000s where movies like Kilometro 31, mm. like sort of like fed off J-horror, which was a very successful genre in Mexico. Mm. But now I think it's steering towards away from the supernatural and closer to everyday horror. Yeah. Mm. So away from yeah. like ghost stories and towards mm. people being horrible. Mm. <laughs> so this, you know? this sort so of, I, I guess... It has to do with the current sociopolitical situation. Which feeds into that um, just wonderful article. I guess that's not really the right word for it, but very strong, powerful article that you've just written for Senses of Cinema on mm. Kelly and the representation of the narco wars. Mm. Um, it was interesting before this panel, I was sort of thinking, well, how does The Untamed 
fit oh, it into fits. that, into into those arguments. Mm. And I'm 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 quite struck at how how directly it does, you oh, know, yeah, sort of absolutely. dealing with these same issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you were just mentioning the the family, mm -hmm. sort of like <coughs> looking at the crime scene, and that's sadly that's an everyday thing for many Mexicans. Yeah. I mean, since uh, 2006, about 200,000 people have been killed violently, which is Incredible. a lot of people. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of corpses. Mm. So this relationship with the body, that this really relationship with like mutilated bodies, uh, you know, torture, kidnappings, mm. is an everyday thing. Yeah. The scene at the end of the film with the, or near the end of the film with the wheelbarrow, with the plastic mm. over the wheelbarrow, I, I mean, without knowing any of that yeah. I mean, you know, have, making those kind of parallels um, mm. is a really upsetting image. Yeah. It's a really devastating moment, I think, um, and, in the yeah. film. But mm. to have that context, I think, sort of amplifies, um, makes it even more horrifying. It does. It does. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, the creature is represented as this thing that can barely be contained, and as well, like it's something yeah. that some of the characters can kind of keep a rein on it, but it can't as well. And it's sort of this sort of a threat of violence and death is kind of basically there all the time. Sort of volatility so. and yeah. instability. Mm -hmm. And I guess yeah. how that feeds into these issues of consent, um, which, yeah, which have these sort of very direct sort of social mm -hmm. um, connections to what's going on at this time. We are going to open up to some questions. Please don't ask us. Actually, no, you know what? Bring on the questions about the fuck beast. I was going to say don't ask us about the fuck beast. I just like saying <laughs> fuck beast. If you have any questions, not too technical, we're nice people. Um, please um, ask away. I've done a lot of Q&As and I have to say this is the one that's like, I have no idea what you people yeah. are going to say. We're, we know as much as you do. That's okay. what I'm saying. <laughs> um, just a couple are, of things. Are you okay? I'm... Are you okay? Me. Like I, I say that as a friend, like after seeing that film. I'm I'm more than okay. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yeah, I, I I loved that film actually. I really, really... Um, just a couple of things. I mean, I didn't want to get into kind of debates about genre, but I, I, I was interested in the way that you both posed, you first as a sort of social realist film and also as a horror film. And it strikes me that um, one thing I've always thought is that genres are more like threads than boxes yeah, yeah. Mm. so that actually it can be both right yeah, yeah, These totally. two yeah. threads are running through it and you could have crime in there as well yeah. right yeah. um so i totally agree with that i don't think it's a hybrid film i don't think it's a like it's no. like alien is like horror slash sci-fi i don't think yeah. this is that i think that the genre for filmmakers of this caliber are a palette and you yeah. can use it like a like a paint box a, yeah. drama, a little bit of horror and a little bit i love that idea of a thread you know you can just yeah. weave these threads through it's a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. Yeah, yeah um, and so, but I wanted to ask you guys about the about the monster. Um, uh oh, <laughs> uh, the, what the fuck uh, beast? What was that? Then? It's he or she. Uh, the say. thing. It's a hit or a hit. The thing. Um, I mean, as horror, of course. I mean, as you've mentioned, horror is traditionally a. It is a genre which has kind of lent itself towards social criticism, and. Um, uh, what interested me was that, you know, the women sexually were much more interested in the creature than, of course, the men. You know, they turn away from the men. But the monster, and the men can't handle the monster and die. Mm. But there's also that interesting thing where the monster hurts her mm. and then almost kind of kills her at the end. And... So I was trying to work through the symbolism of what was going on there and what, um, because there are some films, some horror films, like say Lucky McKee's The Woman, where it's very, it's a very clear kind of criticism of male patriarchal society. There's no, mm -hmm. it seems to me that there's not a great deal of kind of, um, you know, sim sort of complex symbolism happening in something like, the, um, Lucky McKee's The Woman. But in this, the symbol of the monster as a kind of creature which both is the ultimate pleasure machine. You can say fuck beast, it's cool. <laughs> I'm too scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, the dan that is dangerous. Yeah, look, yeah. it's dangerous. And I just wanted to, your thoughts about that. So we, yeah. we, We've had beers and chats um, mm -hmm. b before and I, we've spent a lot of time talking about precisely 
these mm. questions and, yep. and I, I don't I don't mean to sound like a smart ass, but I do think in many ways this film is deliberately impenetrable. Um, I'm fascinated just with the the the, the, the gender of the creature. Um, and um, Cesar was telling me before, so in the in the um, English subtitles, um, Vero calls it it, but the the caretaker couple, the um, the Vegas, I think it is, yeah, yeah. Uh, they call it a he. Hmm. But um, Cesar, you were saying that's not. No, in Spanish, like it's everything just is he. gendered. Yeah, it's, it's just, just he. It. Yeah. Um, so even on that kind of level of can we can we say that mm. the that the fuck beast is representative of a particular gender? It's penetrative. Mm. Yeah. It's it's just I mm. I I'm, I love this film because I can I mm. can dance around it and I can skim across the yeah. surface, but I just can't yeah. find a way in. And um, we were we were having a conversation just before as well about. Whether is is the filmmaker being coy in that um, he doesn't represent the sex um, with the male characters and the beast in the film? In actual fact, um, the, all, all you actually do get to see the um, is that that feminine experience of it, um, and that was kind of I thought really interesting as well because that mm. the genre that it feeds off this kind of tentacle erotica genre mm. is generally pretty hetero. And at least, you know, this is like an equal opportunity sex pest in this one. So that's <laughs> something. But um, it's interesting that you don't see that. And But it also is interesting that the female characters have more agency than the men do yeah. because they have more control maybe over their own desires and mm. also the creature's desires. But you're right, it does sort of begin to sort of turn on them as well. Any other questions? You can say fuck beast too. <laughs> you don't need my permission. Everyone you're has to adult. say it before they leave. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're not getting out. <laughs> so, if the fuck beast <laughs> kills only <laughs> gay men, but then is really great for women, like is it a, is it a metaphor or is it just a thing that's great? Or like, I th I think <laughs> it's a, I think it's a pleasure machine. I mean, I I would open this up to you guys, but mm. I think it's a pleasure machine. Mm. Um, I think it's like um. You could you could kind of it's, almost read it like the, there's this sort of male anxiety about penetration, I yeah. guess, and yeah, that kind again, of plays out in the film. That quite idea a bit of the as politics well. of top, like of you know, are you a top yeah, right. or a bottom? I think that's that's mm. played out. Um, and I, I do think that this film, for me, in a way, the focus on peeing, like we talk a lot about fucking, but there's a lot of weeing in this film, a lot of talk about we, which I think is really, it's this idea of being in control of your body or being yeah. out of control of your body. And what I find so fascinating about what happens in the woodshed um, is that it's almost pre-sexual pre identity, sexual pleasure, um, which mm. in itself is quite fascinating in that the, the fuck beast doesn't, it's just looking for a hole. It just, you know, that's what it's looking for. Yeah. So like um, the ultimate top. Yeah, kind of. yeah. But hmm. where I think the film becomes really interesting is how it problematizes that. You mm. know, we have that amazing scene that uh, Cesar mentioned with all the animals, you know, that the kind of weird antichrist kind of animal orgy is incredible with the, with, with the, with the hipster dog mm -hmm. that I didn't know Aspect about. Aspect dog, that's <laughs> become hipster now. The as <laughs> what a day when I woke up this morning, I did not know that I would say the phrase Aztec hipster dog. Thank you so <laughs> much. Dog, which is a, a band name, by the way, if you're wondering. Lots of umlauts, Aztec yeah. hipster dog. Yeah. Yep. Um, but this is all problematized because people start dying um, yeah. and people mm. start bleeding and people start hurting. So. You know, we might. I think that there's a temptation to look at this mm. at the fuck beast as this kind of liberating thing that this is yeah. where people go to escape homophobia and where they go to escape mm. domestic violence. But ultimately, they also go and they get killed. You know, they yeah, get. Yeah, it goes back to the victim shaming. That yep. Yes, that's that inspired right. the film as mm. well. It's like you're in control of your body; you can feel pleasure, but mm. but you'll die for it. But you'll die. For you'll it. be punished yeah. for it, which yeah. opens up connections to slasher. You know, mm, all of the yeah. kind of gender politics of slasher films, which have been mm. long debated. Um, any other questions? Probably have time for one more question. One more question about the Aztec hipster dog or the fuck beast. This is good. Because <laughs> I haven't used these words. Both before. great band names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they could tour together. This is a little bit le less of a question, just of a comment on, on the question. Yeah, go for it. Um, <laughs> Help. Uh, one of the things, I mean, I, I work as a sort of a science fiction and fantasy and horror writer and and a critic and one of the things that always make you know you're always trying to look for is the symbol which is irreducible like you you don't want the film or the story to be able to be rewritten purely as a realist story otherwise why use the monster so the monster needs to be in some ways 
non-allegorical, but symbolic, if you like, if you want to draw that distinction, that could have multiple ways you can read it. And that, that has to be the essence of, mm. of using a monster. What is the monster? Otherwise, Absolutely. you just use a person. Mm. Yeah, it's like very um, Lovecraftian. Yeah, and yeah. I, I mean, I, when I was looking at it, I just thought, oh, well, this, I mean, this is clearly derived in some way from Lovecraft as well, yeah. of yeah. The, the alien creature that comes down that has sex with people. Mm. Yeah, in this case, it's an alluring monster rather than a horrific one, that, which mm. Lovecraft would have had. So Totally. I mean, it even um, goes back to the Japanese, um, the famous woodcut, that 1814 woodcut, The yeah. Dream of the Fisherman's mm -hmm. Wife. Um, I mean, you know, Legend of the Underfiend, Overfiend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I got that kind wrong. That Japanese manga sort of tentacle Ten erotica yeah. there is again, um, yeah. What I, I mean, what really struck I me, mean, this film had such an extraordinary effect on me and I knew nothing of this context really that, mm. that Cesar is, is sort of provided for us tonight. And, uh, and what I think marks a really strong film is that it doesn't exclude you if you don't have certain kinds no. of knowledge. Hmm. What, what really struck me, strikes me about this film is that it's a sensory experience. Yeah. More yeah. than it is a narrative experience, more than it is an ideological experience, you feel your way through the untamed. Um, and I think it's a very difficult, that's a very difficult choice for a filmmaker to do, to yeah. make, have a film impact you just through s your senses, not through emotions as much as it just senses, just yeah. your skin, hmm. not, not just sight and sound, but you know, the idea of what does it feel like and what does it smell like, those kind of yeah. full bodied. Yeah. And I think that's what body genres do. So horror hmm. obviously most strongly, hmm. but you know, pornography yeah. um, hmm. and um, you know, musicals and gross out comedy, you know, these kind of films, they, they make us feel things. The you affect. Know, the affect. They would exactly. say. <laughs> as, we, as the big kids call it. Yeah. <laughs> Any comments from you, my friend? Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think I was sort of thinking about that as well, actually, the way that um, we, we talked about the kind of the tentacle kind of sex aspect of the film and, and the way it kind of plays on that. And, uh, you know, right, right from the beginning when, when you asked me, you know, well, how did I think about the film? Was like, I think my reaction was like it was more sort of a reaction that wasn't sort of intellectual mm. in a way and was sort mm. of feeling my way. And and I like the way that it actually complicates sex um, in the movie in a way. I think it is it is something that is quite pleasurable and empowering but then dangerous. And so it, you kind yeah. of come, you're you not coming away from it with this really kind of clear-cut message about it. And I think it's, it's kind a, of... It's a film that starts in a difficult place and ends in a difficult place. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, that that's quite audacious. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'd like you to thank with me uh, Spiro and Cesar for hel thank holding you. our hand thank through you this Alexandra. movie. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you so much. And please come along and see Possession if you've not seen it. You are in. It's uh, Isabella Gianni um, and Sam Neill. It's probably Isabella Gianni's best performance by oh, a yeah, long shot. She amazing, won Best yeah. Actress Fantastic. at Cannes for it. Um, the only video nasty to win an award at Cannes. It's a yeah. cracker of a film. Don't miss it. And um, on top of The Untamed, it will just do your head in in the yeah. most just wonderful way. Have a good night. Thanks Thank for joining you. us, guys. <laughs>